Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for This Week in Enterprise Tech is provided by CashFly at C-A-C-H-E-F-L-Y dot com. This is Twyatt. This Week in Enterprise Tech, episode 147, recorded June 29th, 2015, for July 3rd, 2015. Apple exploits and other mythical beasts. Welcome to Twyatt This Week in Enterprise Tech. It's the show dedicated to the enterprise professional, the IT pro, and the geek who just wants to know how the world is connected. I'm your host, Father Robert Ballasier, the digital Jesuit, your guide to all things in the enterprise. And of course, I'm joined by my regular cast of characters, starting with Mr. Brian Chi, the director of the Advanced Network Computing Laboratory in Honolulu, Hawaii. Brian, it's kind of hot over there, yeah? Yeah, we've got a storm north and a storm south, and it's causing everything to sit and we're either tying or breaking heat records in the state of Hawaii. Yay. And that also means you get VOG, right, whenever the winds stop? Actually, with no wind, we get no VOG, but no trade winds mean it's uh, pretty sweltering. Yikes. Well, I also know it's sweltering on the other coast, which means there's no relief for the other part of the Twyatt Triangle. Uh, a man who's currently having technical difficulties with his audio, but brings his brilliance nonetheless. Mr. Curtis Franklin from Information Week Radio. Curtis, how are you on the East Coast? Well, Padre, except for those uh, connectivity issues you t were talking about, things are fine. We're in the middle of the rainy season here in Florida, so uh, things are pretty damp, but it's uh, always good to be here in the nice, dry, quiet studio. Well, Twight Wright, we've got a fun episode planned for you. In just a bit, we're going to be bringing in Steve Gibson, perennial favorite of the Twight Riot. He's, he's our security guru, and he's going to be bringing us through a set of topics that, well, you're going to want to hear about. Before we do that, though, let's go ahead and kick it off with the blips. This first one is all about Juniper, making it easier and faster to peer. Juniper Networks has announced the PTX-1000. It's a 2RU fixed configuration router capable of pushing 3 terabits per second, and specifically designed for a next-generation distributed core network. The new router is specifically designed for peering between service providers. Rather than focusing on a few monster switches with designated peering locations between them, this SDN-capable Express Plus chipset-based router will allow users to distribute peering across multiple points, theoretically decreasing application response time across those peered networks while also increasing reliability and self-healing. Time will tell if other vendors will follow the distributed core model. Juniper's PTX-1000 will hit the channel in the third quarter of 2015. Looks like no speed limit for fiber. Photonics researchers at the University of California, San Diego, pumped up the power and therefore pumped up the distance at which optical signals can be sent through optical fibers. This new high-powered fiber could mean a new path towards ultra-high-speed internet connectivity. The team of electrical engineers broke through key barriers that limit the distance information can travel in fiber optic cables and sent data nearly 7,500 miles through fiber optic cables with standard amplifiers and no electronic regenerators. The team seems to have overcome the Kerr effect, also called the quadratic electro-optic electro effect, QEO, it's a change in the refractive index of material in response to an applied electric field. Basically, the more power you apply, the worse the material gets at passing light. With this out of the way, it's possible that we could see new levels of fiber optic performance in the relatively near future. If you didn't think photovoltaic is changing the world, well, a solar plane just left Nagoya, Japan for Hawaii. Bon voyage! In a record-breaking effort, Swiss pilot Andre Borschberg is flying solo around the world from Abu Dhabi and back. The solar-powered aircraft left Nagoya, Japan early Monday morning on the start of the longest and loneliest five-day leg to Honolulu. The Solar Impulse 2 aircraft is covered by 17,000 photovoltaic cells and nearly 2,000 pounds of lithium batteries in this record-breaking flight. To Andre Borschberg, I wish bon voyage and hope to see you here in Hawaii in a couple of days. 
Are you running a Cisco web security, email security, or security management virtual appliance? Well, if you are, it's time to get patching. The networking giant just released a free patch for WSA, ESA, and SMA products that shipped with identical default SSH keys. The vulnerability could allow unauthenticated remote attackers to get root privileges and launch a man-in-the-middle attack on affected devices. The patch, poetically named the Cisco-SA-2015-0625-Ironport SSH Keys Vulnerability Fix, deletes the default keys from the compromised products and guides users to the process of creating unique keys. The Cisco Product Security Incident Response Team reports that there are no known exploitations of the security lapse and that all future products will ship with the patch. Still, if you're running a Cisco appliance, now might be a good time to update your software. The Supremes tell Google, hey, get your own Java. On Monday, the Supreme Court declined to hear Google's argument to overturn a federal appeals court ruling that Oracle's Java APIs qualify for copyright protection. The case now heads back to a lower court to determine whether Google's use of Oracle's copyrighted APIs can be considered fair use. If Google manages to convince the lower court hearing the case to accept its incorporation of Java APIs in Android as fair use, it will escape unscathed, apart from the cost of litigation. Now, APIs tend to fall into fair use when interoperability is the goal, but Google has hurt itself there by making Android incompatible with the Java platform. Google is working on a plan B, and Android's not likely to fall, but this is just another source of unease and anxiety. Hey, just the sort of jitters a big dose of Java can bring to even the biggest organizations. With nearly seven billion, that's billion with a B, dollars of debt, Puerto Rico says it can't pay it back. An announcement that combined with Greece defaulting on its debt, the financial world is in a flurry and re-examining just how the world rates municipal bonds. This long-reaching change can make it dramatically harder for municipalities around the world to borrow money to fund public works projects and may spell a huge downturn in the world's economy. The truth of the matter is that social services have overextended themselves to the point that governments are more and more frequently defaulting on loan payments, which could spell the start of a depression that only our parents have seen. Hey, business travelers, guess what? I've got some gadgety goodness for you. If you'll be traveling where you're not sure if your hotspot will shine, the Euros may have your next wireless broadband gadget. Last week, the Finnish company, in partnership with ZTE, launched the Goodspeed 4G Mobile, an LTE Wi-Fi hotspot that can hold 10 SIM cards. The Goodspeed supports 8 LTE bands as well as 3G and GSM for fallback in non-LTE-enabled areas. It will switch between any of the 10 SIMs, automatically choosing the native service to keep roaming charges at bay. The device can be shared by up to 15 units, and its battery will last up to 12 hours. Of course, Americans not accustomed to having so many carrier choices will immediately think, what will I do with the other six slots? Well, that does it for the blips. Let's go ahead and jump straight into the bites. This first story is all about the Docker Bros. Now, containers, as we know, are actually an old idea. They've been gaining a lot of traction, a lot of speed, a critical mass, if you will, over the last couple of months because of companies like Docker, which have ste stepped up their container game. Docker made it ridiculously easy to package your service or application and run it on everything from a NAS to super high capacity bare iron. Now, even though the idea of containers is actually old, what we're seeing now is that we're moving to the next logical step for Docker and for containers, which are standards. There is now a consortium consisting of Docker, Core OS, Amazon Web Service, Aspera, Cisco, EMC, Fujitsu, Goldman Sachs, Google, Microsoft, HP, IBM, Intel, Huawei, Joint, Memosphere, Pivotal, Rancher Labs, VMware, and Red Hat. Basically the who's who of container technology. And they've decided to create the Open Container Project. Chibert, let me throw this over to you. Why is it important that, that these rivals, all of these companies that have a big stake in getting customers to, come, to bring their containers to their services, why is it such a big thing for them to be getting together to create this open container? Oh, it's kind of like, oh, gee, you've got to have a specific type of electric iron to run in your home. And if you move, you've got to buy a different... Yeah, standards are everything. Come on. You know, 
Without standards, it means demos don't work. Without standards, um, you know, really complicated apl virtual appliances can't be just downloaded. People want to be able to just run it. A lot of organizations keep forgetting that the bottom line is I don't want to worry about what makes it work. I just want it to work. And I think standards got to happen. Curtis, l let me ask the obvious question here, and that is, why would they do this? I mean, I, I can understand smaller companies banding together because they've got to fight the larger companies, but you've got the who's who in here. You've got Microsoft, you've got Amazon, you've got Google, you've got IBM. These are companies that have invested a lot of money in creating an incredibly strong infrastructure. Why would they want to give equal footing to these other companies, to an EMC, to a Cisco that doesn't have a really good web services platform, to Goldman Sachs, to, to Huawei? Why do this? Why not just say, we'll run our containers, you run your containers? I think it all comes uh, down to money, as most things in this business do. What they're seeing is that the opportunity for increased size of the total pie goes up with interoperability. And remember, the game that a lot of these very large players are in isn't so much the, we want to be your only virtual partner. We want to be your only cloud partner. They just want to be the controlling cloud partner. If you think of cloud, they want to be the company you go to, even if some of your services and some of your data is out on someone else's cloud. That way they have ownership of the customer and ultimately have the largest share of that customer's business. They want to see the pie grow so that they can take the biggest slice and see Docker and standards as the way to get there. We've got JJ, four, JJ to the 4884 in the chat room who's asking, how is this not a monopoly? This is actually the absolute opposite end of a monopoly. It's not a monopoly. It's not even a functional monopoly, which is what we see with things like the, the walled garden of, of iOS or Android. In that, the, in pushing these standards, they're essentially saying you can take your container and... If it's running on Rancher Labs right now, you can run it on VMware hardware. If it's on VM har VMware hardware, you could also run it between the AWS Amazon Web Services cloud and the Google cloud and the Microsoft Azure cloud. So it's, you know, this, this is actually really good for, for the consumer. But as to Curtis's point, I love this idea that they're, they, they are understanding that containers, even though they're hot right now, are still in a very nascent stage. There are a lot of issues that are coming up. Security is not as good as it could possibly be on container technology. You get these standards down. You make it incredibly easy for customers to move from one service provider to another, and you do end up with a larger total pie. So maybe even, you know, as you mentioned, maybe even if your, your, your slice is smaller, it's a bigger pie, so you make more money. Now, here's a few more facts. They're basing the OCP, the Open Container Project, within the Linux Foundation. They want to stop the fracturing of container technology before it starts. So what they're going to do is they're actually pulling out of the Docker project the lib container. That's the, the instruction set that forms the foundation of any containerized application or service. That's what they're going to agree on. That's going to be put into the OCP. It's going to be put under the stewardship of the OCP, which means that any container will work with any provider, but what they are allowing from all of their, their participants is to vary the feature set. So it means that your container will work on VMware and Azure, but there may be some unique features that each provider offers you that give you an incentive to go with one or the other. Chibert, I, I'm going to ask you to stare into your crystal ball. How do you see this playing out? Because containerized applications really lend themselves to hybrid deployment, not just hybrid between my, my on-premise and cloud, but also between cloud partners. It, it can now be that I, I write a service that will automatically choose the, the, the provider that's going to give me the best rate at that particular time, at that particular load. Again, I, I go back to the predictions that Curtis and I put into our cloud computing book. There is going to be a time that you're going to be able to go shopping and move your container around. I don't see why not. You know, there, it's it's the way the mainframe era went. Um, it's the way the PC era went to and kind of stumbled on. But containers are the next mainframe. And being able to move it around means 
you might be more likely to do more stuff in the cloud instead of building your own data center. And from looking at the costs and running my own data center, uh, clouds are looking better and better because, man, they're expensive to run and, man, they're expensive to update. So I like containers. I like the concept. I like the ability to continue running my prototypes in-house and then move them up into a service that makes sense. And there's really no reason why I can't say globally load balance across multiple container services around the world and shop for the best rates. And like Curtis said, it's increasing the size of the pie because more and more people are going to start thinking containers rather than running their own data center. Uh, Curtis, I, I want to throw something over to you. I'm, I'm not sure if, if you actually have any insight on this, but I, again, I'd like to get the executive level view. When you start thinking about having an open container project and all these, all these large vendors taking part and offering a standard to which you can build your containerized application or service, what then happens to virtualized machines, virtual machines? Uh, we, we've been talking about how there's still space for both containers and VMs, specifically because VMs were more, more mature, they run on more platforms at the moment, they, they can offer new features that you can't get from containers. But with this new development, if I can now write a single container and have it run basically anywhere, what room does it leave for VMs? Well, I think VMs are left in a couple of places. One is in what we'll now call the new legacy applications. So not legacy in terms of mainframe, as we, we typically describe it, but legacy in terms of uh, virtualized workloads that have been sitting out there running in a very stable fashion for, you know, let's call it five or ten years. Companies are going to be very reluctant to move those. The other place that you're going to, to see virtual uh, maintaining a hold on things um, are those new applications where people feel that they need to have the most stable, the most, well, call it what it is, old technology. The places where you're going to see containers coming into their own are the newer applications where cost is a huge factor and where it's felt that they perhaps aren't quite as mission critical. People are going to start taking flyers on newer, less critical applications. And as those prove themselves, I think we'll see the migration start to happen. Frankly, I think that's why you see a company like VMware in this coalition. They, they see the future very plainly. I suspect they just hope it's going to be another decade before that future fully arrives. Let's go ahead and jostle over to the next story. This one, actually, I'm basing off of an article that, Curtis, that you brought to Information Week, and it's about IBM making a partnership with Box. Now, last Wednesday, IBM and Box announced a partnership to combine Box's file storage and sharing expertise with IBM's muscle in, in, in enterprise management. Now, customers are supposed to be able to use Box's mobile apps and software APIs to interface with data stored in IBM's enterprise cloud service. The hope is that it will give users an easy to use interface with IBM's enterprise grade security. Curtis, what exactly does this mean? Why, why would IBM choose Box and vice versa? Well, I think for Box, it's a pretty easy sell because Box, uh, like Dropbox, like a bunch of other consumer oriented cloud storage companies, would love to be in the larger dollar enterprise market. Box very rationally sees IBM with its legacy in the enterprise as a good way to get there. Now, what IBM is looking for boils down to Box's APIs and Box's expertise at moving off of mobile devices into the cloud. If you don't think that's important, think back to IBM's partnership with Apple. Think about all of those Apple iOS apps that use Box as a native storage technology. And then think about IBM not having to write their own APIs for all of the vertical market apps that they're bringing out for iOS. It makes a lot of sense for both companies because each company is looking for something entirely different 
out of the relationship, I think that makes it much more likely that both companies will continue to be happy with what goes on as Box is introduced into more and more enterprises. Oh, okay. All right. Uh, Chibert, let me throw this over to you really quickly. We've seen over the past year IBM going into a flurry of purchases. They have they have made acquisitions left and right, big ones and small ones, strategically to get them into big data. That's been that's been their push. They want to do big data analytics. They want to be the name that people turn to when they have a disparate set of data points and they want to turn it into something that's monetizable. Going into storage, even though even though the way that Curtis explains it, it does make sense. I mean, I understand where they're going with this, it doesn't seem to fit with that big data push. Or is there an angle here that I'm missing? Well, I think one of the angles you're missing is that IBM has had some absolutely spectacular failures in the mobile market. And I don't think they want to, they don't want to rerun. So I think what they're doing is they're, they're I want, I want to say IBM wants to be able to get in the mobile market. They want to be able to leverage Box's experience, but they don't want the risk. I think IBM's uh, acquisition flurry has all been core business. I don't think Box is a core business for IBM. I think it's going to be an add-on to a core business. And personally, I think, you know, of playing around a little bit, I think Box's API, Box's strength in API is going to help IBM leverage Internet of Things, which they are very much interested in. And there's some really in, there's some really cool things in the API that some of their competitors just don't have. And that's things like auto encryption. It's things like um, key exchange. Um, the API set from Box that I have been able to see has been pretty strong. And unfortunately, I have not been able to get the same kind of documentation out of Dropbox. Mm, actually, good point. And actually, Creamy Corncob makes a, a very good point that uh, attaches to your view. Uh, he says that IBM's only push right now is big data and cloud. They had to make a, a move to turn things around. Uh, and that, that actually ties in, Chibra. I, I do want to throw back to you because I, I, wanna, I want you to expand on that a little bit. This idea that this is their first user-facing offering. They've been doing a lot of business, corporate, enterprise-faced offerings. What, what would make this a success? So let, let's move a year down the, the line. We're, we're doing next uh, June's episode of This Week in Enterprise Tech. And something that has happened says, okay, this was, this was a good deal for IBM or this was a bad deal for IBM. Well, I think it's the connectors that they're going to make into big data and how the Internet of Things will tie into that. So keep in mind, Box's strength is that API. They spent a lot of time and money, a lot of documentation, a lot of how-tos, a lot of white papers. <clears throat> so they spent the time on that. And that's something that IBM likes. They want, you know, I could easily see IBM having a Box-enabled big data application where it will store in Box and then have... Um, possibly containers, moving it up and integrating it within the corporate data infrastructure. Because remember, one of the things that scares a lot of enterprises is garbage in, garbage out. So if it's coming directly in, um, it's scary because you might have some really, really bad data coming in. So one of the things even in the science community goes, we have middleware. And IBM's strength has always been middleware. Take the data look at it, make sure it makes sense, containerize it, you know, put it into a format that works for the enterprise and then move it into the corporate database. That way you have additional APIs in the, in the middleware to be able to go and feed and trigger other interesting things like coupons or, you know, sales emails, you know, all kinds of different things. It creates for a much, much richer environment and having that encrypted path means there's more of a trusted data path to get that data from the edge. In this case, it's the mobile edge. Curtis, you wrote about this, so I, I, I'll throw the speculation to you. What's the smart money saying about this? It's not an acquisition. This is a partnership, which already, that's that's an interesting point of view of why, micro, why IBM decided to go that route rather than trying to make it an acquisition outright. But what's the what are the analysts saying about this? Is, is this a good thing? Is this a bad thing? Is this a Hail Mary pass? 
What's the scuttlebutt? Well, I don't think anyone's seeing it as a Hail Mary, but uh, the analysts that I've spoken to see it as a good thing. Now, it's, it's interesting because right after it happened, uh, box stock went down. I think there were uh, some financial folks who were hoping that it would be an acquisition rather than a partnership. But that aside, I think it really does make sense for both companies. The analysts think so because, as I said, the companies are not competing. They're looking for different things from the relationship, and that gives them room to really work at this and make sure that it's successful for both sides. The more that the box APIs are used, we can assume that uh, they're getting some, some money off of this, some revenue, some licensing fees. And the fact is that as IBM brings them in, even if the box APIs are used to store information directly on the IBM cloud, it brings about this idea that Box is, in fact, an enterprise-ready service. And that can do nothing but good for them as they go out and look for, say, the businesses that aren't large enough to attract IBM's interest. Uh, this one, I think, has very little downside for either company and a lot of upside for both the two vendors and their customer community. Well, gentlemen, thank you very much for those enterprise bites. Now is the time of the show that I have been very much looking forward to because it means I get to speak with the security guru of Twit TV, Mr. Steve Gibson. Steve, <laughs> welcome back onto This Week in Enterprise Tech. Hey, Padre, great to be with you guys again. Of course, Steve Gibson from GRC.com. He is the host of Security Now, along with Leo Laporte. He gives us all the information we need about the most pressing security threats that we face in the world of IT. But Steve, we brought you on to talk about four stories in particular. The first two are about BYOD. This has been a craze. This, actually, BYOD really started making the, its mark about the time that we started This Week in Enterprise Tech. And it was this whole idea of bringing in devices, personal devices, connecting them up to enterprise class networks, and having to deal with all the consequences of having that. Well, we've got two security flaws, one dealing with OS X and iOS, and the other one dealing with Samsung devices. So we wanted to talk about that. We also wanted to talk about a BGP leak that may have affected many members of the Twilight Riot. And finally, we've got a story that uh, we covered slightly a few weeks back, and that was uh, data loss on SSDs and a particular interaction we have with your very own spin right but let's start at the top tell me a little bit about this os 10 ios cross application security flaw so I, I can only really tell you a little bit because it's still shrouded in darkness essentially i mean you know that apple is not traditionally as forthcoming about security issues as for example microsoft uh, or google uh, you know google's just sort of has a whole open source public facing approach and microsoft just has you know uh i guess more more history and they've sort of evolved their whole security management apple is still keeping these things relatively uh close to the vest now the problem is with, with appears to be intrinsic function in both like common function in both uh, Mac OS 10 and iOS involving the application sandboxing that we just tend to assume they've gotten right. Um, two university uh, security teams work together and ask the question, how well does the Mac OS 10 and iOS application sandboxing work? And they found, and, and this was something that sort of hadn't been tested yet over on the Apple side. What they found was very disturbing. Um, they, they initially contacted Apple in October of last year, 2014, and said, hey, uh, we've penetrated your application, your, your inter-application isolation, like to a huge and disturbing degree, uh, you need to fix this. Apple said, oh, oh, oh uh, give us six months. Then four months later, Apple said, uh, can we have your research? And oh, by the way, we want another six months. 
Well, these guys gave them another two months and then went public with this. So Apple has not yet officially responded. We and and I think one of the reasons is that this appears to be deep intrinsic features of both of these OS platforms, which are probably not easily changed. What we know is, for example, that that apparently applications can apply better authentication measures to a number of APIs, which, which are used for for secure inter-application access. You know, things like accessing the 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 keychain and iCloud services. Yet Apple hasn't explicitly said that those those additional authentication measures must be taken. So for example, this group developed some auditing technology to scan applications, both Mac OS 10 applications and iOS applications. Uh, to, and to give you a sense for this, of the 1612 OS 10 applications and 200 iOS apps, 88.6% of those that were tested were found to be, in their words, completely exposed to unauthorized cross-app resource attacks. That's the acronym they've, they've given this, X-A-R-A, cross-app resource attacks, which allow malicious apps to obtain credentials for other apps running on the same platform. And this again, little is known about this, but it appears that the that what has to happen is that an an app needs to a, a victim app innocently obtains its keys, for example, from the system keychain, and the malicious app is able to intercept in real time, in some fashion, that access and and snag the keys. Um, they were they were able to uh, get several of their test apps through Apple's own store scrutiny, where they look for 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 malicious action. So they so even after Apple was notified, Apple was notified as I mentioned in October of 2014. In January, this group um, got apps into the store. And those apps were using this technology that they have, have come up with in order to, to obtain keys, uh, all kinds of keys, from 88.6% from, from of the apps that were tested uh, turned out to be vulnerable. They apparently have a detection technology which allows, which means it's possible to detect when apps are doing this. So... At this point, we know there's a problem. Apple hasn't made an official statement. They're, I'm sure they're wishing that the world didn't know about this now, but the world does. And the several of the of the apps which were were tested. I know that one password was an example of of one. Um, Evernote is another. The, the the people who have made comments about this have said that this is not something that apps can change. Um, Chrome on, on, on the iOS and Mac OS X platform immediately upon being notified removed um, support for the keychain from Chrome in order to protect Chrome's users from, from, from this. As soon as Google learned that, this, that, that the keychain was one of the vulnerable um, resources that that, that uh, apparently could be spied on. Um, so th th the assumption is that Apple can't make a big change because maybe that's going to break things that applications are relying on. And the application authors are saying, this isn't something we can do by ourselves. We need OS support for this. So it really sounds like a big mess, which was was present for some length of time and Apple is no doubt even more so now that this is public trying to fix it but the problem is I get the sense that they can't fix it without breaking what the, a lot of what they've already done and there's there's no workaround for this right I mean it's it's not like 
saying, "Oh, let's just turn off Java." There's this is this is in the kernel. I this think is, this is deep. This is deep in fundamental assumptions that have been made. There, there's this. There, there okay. So the question is, okay, eighty-eight point six percent of apps aren't or are vulnerable. Well, that means that there are some that aren't. So is it because they're performing this additional authentication, which Apple didn't make a, apparently didn't make enough of a point of saying applications should use except that the some app authors have said they can't solve it themselves which implies it takes more than just them asking for additional authentication like like somehow both i, I get the sense both apps and the os are going to have to do it you know in concert which is going to be difficult to coordinate since there is some approach apparently for detecting it, what Apple may be doing as an interim measure is planning to 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 like upgrade the OSs to catch malicious apps in um in 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 the in the act of doing this, and maybe strengthen their app screening uh, in a way that that would catch apps that 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 add this technology. Even though the uh, the the guys have shown that the current screening isn't catching malicious apps. Steve, Steve, let me ask you this. The sandbox aspect of how software runs in iOS and OS X has always been touted as, well, yeah, that's duh. That's the way you do it. That's that's right. the bulletproof feature that makes... Like problem solved. Exactly. <laughs> and now that we know that, ooh, it's not a pure... It's not a real sandbox. This is... this is It's not... They're not isolated sandboxes. Is this something that has existed... All this time, and we're only picking up on it now, or is it something that they introduced during a rev? No, it, the, the feeling is that this has always been present, and that this group just decided to test Apple sandboxing, which was touted as being bulletproof because you know Apple, especially on the iOS platform, has made such a big deal about the security. And from a from a security standpoint, we all know that that sandboxing is a challenge because you know the 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 standard wisdom in security is that it's always difficult to prevent something that sort of would naturally happen from happening it's like a firewall a firewall is trying to keep something from happening so the challenge is penetrate that as opposed to it just being intrinsically impossible for it to happen. So, you know, we've got multiple apps running in, you know, on a single OS platform, which is all about sharing access to resources. So it's not natural to have a sandbox. That's something you have to impose on applications, which means that the challenge is making them bulletproof. And it, it looks like there was some mistakes <laughs> that were made in the past. Well, pretty pretty huge mistakes. Uh, yeah. Let me throw over to Chibert here. Chibert, there was something that we we've, we've sort of picked up as a mantra here on Twite, and that is transparent failure. We got that from from uh, Mr. Gear last year at Black Hat. His thing was like, there's there's going to be failures. There's always going to be failures, and the only way to fight them now in this day and age is to be 100% transparent about when that failure occurs. This, the, the way that Steve describes it, this was a miserable failure of trying to get to transparent failure. Well, I think a lot of this trans, lack of transparency, they're, they're actually, I, I kind of like the middle ground. You know, once Apple verified that this is a real and persistent threat, I would have, you know, if I was running their group, I would have brought them in. I would have shanghai them and grabbed them and dragged them over to Sun, Sunnyvale or whatever and say, hey, work with our people, see if we can come up with a fix. In the meantime, simultaneously, gee, it would have been nice to tell your partners, especially the ones that were vulnerable. You know, that 88.6%, I would have notified them so you could start getting some input. No one's going to solve this by themselves. The, the whole system is so complex, there's so many moving parts that it can't be solved really by a single person. It needs to be solved as a group. Thank you, JJ2 to 484, yes, Cupertino. And work together. Um, I think that's one of the things. Transparency is great because what it does is it tells people about the issues that are affecting them. And through that kind of transparency, a, a mind meld can happen. More people can work on it together. Uh, and that's the way you fix things. Um, 
I'm sorry, Apple. You guys have had this not invented here attitude for so, so long that you're kind of forgetting that there's some really, really smart people out there that are actually willing to help you. And I think it would be kind of nice for you to adopt a little more transparency, get the smart people to work with you, and maybe you can come out with a better product and make the world a safer place. Steve, uh, speaking of the not invented here syndrome, the way you described it, it sound as, sounds as if Apple was a little adversarial with this research group. It was sort of like, yeah, uh, give us time and we'll, we'll take care of it, but, but go away. Yeah, I, I think that they're just the, the sense I get. I think I think Brian's exactly right about this, about their their fundamentally wrong approach is they get defensive and don't want this to be true. Unfortunately, wanting doesn't make it so. And as as we look at the timeline, it very much looks like four months went by during which nothing happened. And then they said, let us have an early copy of your paper and we need another six months. That's like what what were you doing for the first first for the first four months before you asked for a copy an early copy of the research? It very much looks like they just they weren't taking it seriously, and now they're no doubt really scurrying around and and upset, and they're probably upset at the researchers when you know as as Brian says they really need to turn that inwards and and take a look at their approach because they, they they're not an island much as they try to have a walled garden approach to, you know, everything in their their consumer world. They're in the computer business now. Steve, I think it's safe to say that this is this is the biggest screw up in the Apple walled garden that we've seen. Yeah. Which we, and I want to throw this over to Curtis. Curtis, why have we not heard about this? I mean, granted this is relatively new, but this is huge. This is bigger than most of the the terrifying exploits that we've seen because of the pervasiveness of these operating systems and i hate to say it because of the presumed security you have people who own these products and just assume because it's got the apple logo on it i'm not vulnerable to any of that and now there's this narrative this new narrative of not only are you vulnerable to these things most of your apps have been vulnerable for years I think there are a number of reasons that, that we haven't seen more news about this. Uh, one of them, uh, frankly, has to do with the news cycle ex itself. The uh, OPM disaster has kind of sucked all the air out of the room when it comes to covering anything else in computer security for the last couple of weeks. Now, with that aside, there are a couple of other things that I think lead a lot of people to feel that from their perspective, and, and I'll agree that it's an erroneous one, this isn't nearly as big a deal as some people say it is. First, if you look at this, you have to be able to get a malicious bit of code into the Apple store. Um, now, it's possible to do that. We've, we've been shown that it can be done. A lot of people, though, still believe that the Apple approval process adds a valuable layer of security. It probably does. The other thing is that we don't know of any exploits using this that are in the wild. It doesn't mean they're not there. It means that we don't know of them. And so as long as this remains in the realm of the theoretical, then most people, the consumers, of course, aren't going to worry about it at all. And I think that even a lot of enterprise IT folks are looking at it and frankly placing more trust than they probably should in IBM's app screening process. Um, and you know where that comes in, if I were Apple right now, in addition to all of the things that Steve's been talking about, I would be making absolutely sure that any apps that come into the Apple app store are absolutely clean and absolutely rock solid. Now, uh, Steve, I, I I don't want to do a, a, the whole Apple bashing thing. So let's let's be fair here because Apple didn't have the only high level vulnerability that was revealed in the last couple of weeks. <laughs> there was a it was a small one involving a few devices from an yeah. Android manufacturer. Only about six hundred million oh, uh, whatever. <laughs> Samsung phones. <laughs> uh, this one just you just have to shake your head, um, I, and I would love to be a, a fly on the wall and a real insider and like understand how this happened. Um, the 
uh, all of the Galaxy S6, S5, S4, uh, and S4 mini phones, which total more than 600 million devices, ship with a default keyboard whose technology uh, comes from Swift. Now, this is not the aftermarket or after-purchase add-on full Swift key replacement keyboard. They just, you know, Samsung just just did an OEM license with Swift for the, the base default factory keyboard. It turns out that that keyboard has, uh, for, first of all, it runs not quite with root privileges, but was one notch away from that in, on the Android platform, and that's system privileges, which are just about as powerful as, as root. And in fact, they're powerful enough to do damage. So you've got the, the Swift keyboard app running with system privileges. It has the ability to check for updates. Sometimes, you know, you want to install a language pack in the keyboard or it just checks for, for updates from, from, you know, the mothership. It turns out that it does so over a plain text, unencrypted HTTP connection, which just... You can't even believe that that's happening in this day and age because what that means is that anybody who has network access, you don't need fancy SSL proxying or or certificate spoofing or, or anything because this is a simple, unencrypted, plain text link that anybody can intercept. It makes a connection to swiftkey.net slash Samsung slash download slash V1.3 hyphen USA. Uh, and then it, and it obtains over a standard get, an HTTP get command, a zip file, which, which contains a, a bunch of assets which are then updated. The security researcher who found the problem experimented with this, changing the zip contents himself. It didn't work. It turns out that there's an SHA hash to authenticate the zip, but the hash is also obtained over a non-secure connection. So what he did was he created a malicious payload, which includes included some exes, some executable content. He, he took an SHA-1 hash of that. He, so he then first updated the hash, then injected this 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 malicious payload and w and was able to cause the update process of the default keyboard on 600 plus million Samsung Galaxy S6 5 and 4 phones to execute his payload with system privileges which are nearly as powerful as root privileges plenty powerful to install apps to 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 to, to spy on things to have essentially complete run of the android file system um and uh samsung was notified last december of this problem and as of today most of the of the providers uh in the u.s are you know still have haven't confirmed that they have have moved to fix this? <laughs> it, it, it's it's mind-boggling. Okay, first of all, that you'd have your get unencrypted. Uh, I mean, yeah. I I can understand you doing that as long as your hash was protected, because then even if someone tried to man in the middle right. of you, it, the right. file would get into your device and it would say, no, 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 this is not the right thing. But th to then not protect the hash. It, it, <laughs> It really sounds as if some engineer got a checklist of the things that they must do, and it said, must have hash. Uh, okay, well, well, here it is. Uh, it, you know, anybody who's running even the, the, the most basic version of Kane and Abel can do an ARP spoof inside of a hotel, yep. Yep. and you'd be guaranteed there's at least a half a dozen Samsung devices because they're everywhere. And you could take advantage of this update process to, to load your, your malware. And, and the, the consequences are amazing. I mean, what you can take over, basically every device on the phone, you can take over the microphone, the, the, the camera, the GPS. Uh, it's, 
again, it's it's one of these. Yeah. Uh, I I don't understand how this got through quality assurance. One of the things that I forgot to mention is that disabling the default keyboard and replacing it does not solve the problem. Even if you're not using the keyboard that came with it, there is no way to remove or disable the the built-in keyboard uh, service that's still there. And even if you've re if you've replaced the keyboard, it still checks for updates. Now, to, for the exploit to function, you there are some some fortunately some mitigations that make this a little less you know running around with your hair on fire, um, and that is. Someone's phone needs to perform these get queries in order to pull in the SHA-1 hash and then pull in an update if one is available. It only does that periodically on its own or if you do a reboot. So th there would probably need to be some social engineering also, like you set up your ability, uh, as you said, to do an ARP spoof connection interception and then say, hey, you know, uh, I want to show you something, uh, but you'll have to restart your phone to do it. You know, probably get someone to do a phone restart because while the phone is in the process of booting itself up, uh, that's when the this native built-in unremovable, undisableable service goes out and makes its queries and then allows you to perform essentially a complete takeover of the phone. Right. But I mean, if, if I, if I were to try to take advantage of something like this, I would park myself at a Starbucks. Yep. I would have Wireshark running. I would just have it looking for that update. And when it sees it, just go ahead and send out the package. In uh, fact, there is a YouTube video th that, that the guy who did this produced, and he has a little, uh, a little man in the middle proxy running, which looks it, it's just scanning the stream, looking for for this particular get. It intercepts it, and then it, it, it triggers a script which replaces the payload and sends it back to the phone. <sighs> okay, so yeah. and this is why we grouped this together with iOS. This is BYOD things that you need to be aware of, which is if you're going to allow these devices into your enterprise class network, you have to understand what they're vulnerable to. I, I, I want to move on. I, we could talk about these two vulnerabilities forever and ever, <laughs> but the next story, it, it's, it's right up our alley. There was a massive route leak that caused an internet slowdown, and it was traced back to a, a BGP leak. Could you, could right. you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, I, I do want to mention, though, for, for listeners who are concerned about this uh, Samsung problem, that, that this was found by NowSecure.com and that there's a page they're maintaining, NowSecure.com slash keyboard hyphen vulnerability. And in case, it's, in case it's case sensitive, it's all lowercase, keyboard hyphen vulnerability at NowSecure.com. And when I talked about this on the last Security Now podcast a, a week ago last Tuesday, it was either unknown or not fixed across the board. No, none of the various cellular vendors had, had confirmed that this had been fixed. Um, hopefully, we will see that changing now that this has gotten a lot of attention and, and some pressures being put on them. Okay, so BGP. Um, we know how big iron routers sitting around the internet, um, shuffle the internet's connectivity back and forth. You know, these big iron routers are, for example, on either end of these fiber optic cables that we were talking about er earlier in, in the show, which are now being able to, be being pushed to move more bandwidth. They basically um, look at packets coming in and quickly divide them into like where they're going, like which other interfaces um, connecting to other routers um, should this packet be forwarded to. That's done, that, that decision's being made by routing tables, wh wh which essentially match from the high end of the IP down. They perform a, the, the, the largest match um, that they need to in order to pick an individual interface in the routing table to forward this packet to its destination. In order to synchronize routers, there is a protocol, Border Gateway Protocol, BGP, which is a, it's a TCP protocol where separate from this 
the actual packet level traffic, which is moving back and forth, the, the routers establish TCP connections with all of the other routers that they're talking to in order to, in order to es essentially share their routing tables so that, th that is to say, these are the routes which I manage and that information goes to the routers at the other end of the links so that those routers know how to manage, the, how to update their tables in order to, to forward packets to the router that says it's able to, to manage uh, routes that it has. So what, so, and this whole protocol was, as, you know, sad as it is, it was literally designed by a couple of the early internet engineers over some beer on napkins on the back i'm not kidding you on the back it was actually three napkins where they sketched out the original bgp protocol never intending for it to last this long never intending i mean like not designing something to be utterly robust and stable just they had a problem they had to solve that afternoon so they said okay well Let's just do this for now, and then we'll come up with something better later. Well, it worked, and as is so often the case on the Internet, if it works, well, we'll we have other problems to worry about, so we'll just not mess with this for, 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 the, for the time being because what we've got works. The problem is that it, it's fundamentally fragile. The BGP system relies on implicit trust. That is, there's no checks and balances. There's no verification built into this. If a router declares that it has routes, you know, high quality routes for a certain block of IP addresses, all the other routers believe it. It, it believes it has these. It sends them out over the BGP protocol to all of the routers that it's connected to. They forwarded it to all the routers they're connected to. And so this belief propagates what can happen, what has happened a number of famous times. I mean, these are famous events because they're, they're high-impact events on the Internet. What, what can happen is that somebody probably innocently misconfigures their routing table on a on a on a well-placed router and in, in a way that that for a while for like a few hours damages the internet and as you say padre this happened a couple weeks ago a major router made the mistake of broadcasting the i think it was 179,000 routes which normally belong to level three, it said, uh, send all of that to me. That is to, to, to our network. So all of the routers that it was connected to said, wow, really? Uh, okay. And began, and, and that, 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 that mistake propagated through the internet. And suddenly this one ISP was, was receiving all of level three's traffic through Europe and Asia way more than it had the capacity to handle. And so saturation of its links hit 100%. It, it, essentially, it DDoSed itself by saying that it could handle all of these, all of these prefixes, these network address prefixes that, that, that should have been distributed, that level three should have been, been handling. It said, no, 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 send it all to me. We have, we have a direct connection. And so the, the BGP system did what it was designed to do, but without the checks and balances that these guys knew by the time they were done with napkin number three, well, you know, this is really going to be kind of fragile, but it'll it'll allow routers to synchronize their tables, and we'll come up with something good, uh, you know, someday. And they never did. As a consequence, for about three hours, there was major connectivity problems through Europe and Asia getting, uh, about a week and a half ago, getting to level three because one ISP said, yeah, we can do all of that. We'll handle all the traffic. And their link saturated and nobody could get to level three because they thought they were supposed to send their traffic to this one ISP. 
when as soon as that as soon as the problem was figured out they removed the routes from from their routing table bgp you know breathed a sigh of relief propagated the fix and everything went back to normal you know it, it's interesting that that happened as an accident but i remember i think the last major incident we had with G bgp was iran iran had an issue with youtube and they didn't want anyone in iran iran watching youtube so some tech said Oh, well, I'll just route all of YouTube to our server and we'll tell them they can't access it, not realizing that that was going to advertise the route to the world. I, I think yes. YouTube was down for like three or four <laughs> hours. Uh, yes. I, mean, I, I want to throw this over to Chibert. Chibert, we've, we play with BGP every year when we assemble the interop net. And, you know, we've had issues where somebody fat fingers a configuration and suddenly we're sending traffic off into a black hole. Uh, but the, the weird part about this, as Steve has, has already explained, BGP is based on good internet citizenship. You need to watch your routes. You need to make sure they're right. You have to double check them. And it's incumbent upon you to play nice with everybody else. It is absolutely, I mean, we talk about DNS being a weak link. BGP is far more vulnerable because all it takes is one admin who goes crazy and suddenly t starts taking routes from around the world. Now, keep in mind, BGP does some really, really cool things. In fact, Server 2012 R2 can now talk BGP. Now, when I first saw that, I kind of freaked out because it's all too easy. I've, I've actually had a case where I was actually trying to download a, a driver set from Spirant, which was actually only two miles away from me. And I ended up doing a trace route and finding out someone had fat fingered a BGP route. And my, my crossover from the dot com world to the internet too was in Chicago, for God's sakes. So it... It happens accidentally more often than we'd like to um, think. But one of the things I did find out in researching this is most of the ISPs, if, say, for instance, Joe Blow Dentist Office goes and puts in a, mistakenly puts in a BGP route for something like 10.0.0.0 and advertises that accidentally in his server 2012 just because he's fussing around with the new feature. Most ISPs on Earth will filter that. The problem is this was happening at a very high level. And the higher the level you go, the more trust you put in BGP and the more trust you put in the BGP router geeks. Now, keep in mind, one of the things that I've learned over many years of playing around with the Internet gang is BGP isn't that hard. You know, it's, it's a relatively simple protocol. What makes a, route, a BGP router geek or router god, as we tend to call them at Interop, it's not the knowledge of BGP. It's the social engineering because you need to have a great level of trust that the routes that you're advertising and the routes that you're willing to accept are correct. So the router geeks at Interop have this long, long, long relationship with some very high level other router geeks at the upstream uh, ISPs. So that they can do things like, for instance, when Slammer hit, the interop guys actually had ACLs applied on the upstream router within 10 minutes. This would have never happened without that level of social engineering. So should BGP change? Probably. Will BGP change? Maybe. But right now, let's not give the keys to the tank that... You know, if the, someone's a newbie at BGP, well, have someone watch over their shoulder, please. Oh, we, I do want to move on to the last story, but I, I will say on this, hey, uh, enterprises, just especially if you run a, a high-level router, be really, really good to your BGP guys. Uh, Steve, this one, I, I was just tickled to find this because we did cover the stories about SSDs losing data, and there was a story about how excessive heat could cause it to lose data. We had Alan Malventano, and he basically said... No, stop, ignore, That's they're just trying to scare you. But you do have a story here about SSDs and specifically how they might interact with SpidWrite, which is, I, I want to hear about this. Uh, tell, me, tell me all about it. Okay, so when, when SSDs were born, we all danced, figuring that, okay, great. The, the problem with mechanical mass storage is going to be over. And... Because SSDs are solid state, 
they're going to be like RAM. They're going to be like absolutely bulletproof and solid and just solve the whole problem. It turns out that that we should have known better because it it would be it would be entirely possible for the hard drive industry to make an absolutely reliable hard drive today if it had the storage density of maybe a decade ago. But nobody would buy it because it doesn't have the storage density that they want. The point is that we, sort of market pressures always force manufacturers to cram absolutely as many bits into the storage as they possibly can right up to the point where it's just reliable enough. You know, it'll last a few years. Um, the price is right. The storage is unbelievable. And it's mostly reliable. Well, it turns out that unfortunately, even though SSDs are solid state, the same market pressures and, and reality applies. An SSD essentially stores bits in capacitors, which are are basically a floating island where where you inject through an insulator electrons and strand them there. And this is the reason why heat can be an issue is because if there's any leakage, that leakage will be greater at higher temperature, just because as we know, chemicals are more active at higher temperatures. So, so the, the, uh, the more reliable older technology SSDs were SLCs, single level cell, meaning that the individual cell only held a, a zero voltage or a one voltage. And that means that the, 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 the determinant was 50%. Is the cell above or below 50%? And, and so the, the idea would be that that was a, a relatively high reliability test. But market pressures and manufacturers said, well, you know, what if we put four levels of voltage in a cell? That means we could store two bits in a cell rather than just one bit. And then we would say, is it, is it at zero volts, a quarter charged, a half charged, or three quarters charged or, or more in order to in order to store um, two bits. Now we're hearing that they're talking about maybe three bits and four bits in these. So so what what happened is in the same way as happened with hard drives, hard drives started having so much density on them that that manufacturers became reliant on error correction. That is, the, they knew that the, the, that the sectors would tend to not read back correctly, so they would use math in order to, to fix the problems. And that we have, we, it turns out we have exactly the same phenomenon with SSDs now. SSD storage is unreliable enough that error correction is required in order to, I mean, it's assumed that error correction is going to be there in order to sort of bring you back from, from sectors which cannot be fully correctly read. And this is why it turns out that we're seeing reports now from many SpinWrite users that they're able to recover, to use SpinWrite, which was originally designed for for the lack of reliability in hard drives exactly in the same way with the lack of reliability in solid state systems because SpinRite is all about dealing with error correction codes and uh, essentially allowing you to recover what what the what what the hard drive or the SSD controller has decided is no longer correctable it's an unreadable sector SpinRite reads them anyway uh, one of the things that uh, that came out of this analysis was this idea of right now there's this mad dash to make everything SSD. Everything goes flash because we've seen how fast it is. Even on the right side, when you start looking at something like the uh, the SanDisk uh, Infinity Flash Array, that thing is a monster. Yeah. But interestingly, what this data is starting to show is uh, a proper enterprise approach would be a hybrid approach. When you have data that is being written 
constantly just changing yes. on a very quick basis you could do it with flash but it's probably not efficient to do that you, you probably still want some rotating storage in your, right. in your plant it's essentially the way to think of it is that magnetic media does not fatigue when you change it that is you are you're you're laying down little north and south pole domains on the magnetic media and it's fine with that but the way flash works remember i talked about there being like a a little island of a, a little island that is stranded where electrons are injected through uh, essentially um, high voltage is used to break down the insulation to inject electrons onto a little floating uh, conductive island and they're stranded there and then they can be sensed electrostatically so reading is not a problem we can sense them but writing you either have to break down the insulator to inject them or break it down in order to remove them that's why writing fatigues ssds ssds um, are aged everybody knows SSDs are aged by writing, but it this is the mechanism. It, it's that by by breaking down that insulator over and over and over, you start to increase what's called its parasitic leakage, where it just start you know you you've broken it down too much, and so now it begins to have some holes poked in it that that allow that charge to bleed off, and and then you start having consistent problems with your SSD. Curtis, I want to throw this over to you because, again, I want, I want the enterprise view on this. Is there, I know there's a lot of talk about what, what flash arrays can do for the enterprise, especially transactional databases where they're looking at just ridiculous amount of, of read and write speeds. Is there an awareness of the necessity of a hybrid approach? I mean, do they understand that replacing the entire storage plant with flash, while maybe incredibly fast for a couple of months, will start to slow down as you start to approach those levels of, of parasitic leakage? I think that uh, in most enterprises, there is a pretty good understanding of what's going on with SSDs. Uh, we're hearing a lot of people talking about the various tiering strategies for storage from uh, in-memory computing to SSDs to uh, spinning magnetic media down to uh, something like tape even. You know, the, the issue that we're seeing a lot of, though, is this being the kind of application where IoT comes in because the notion of predictive analytics and predictive maintenance is critical. You know, Steve's been talking about that slowing down that takes, point, that takes place. Uh, what we're looking at is different companies who are putting systems in place to measure that. And as things start to slow down a bit, then they schedule devices for replacement. The idea is to replace them before they ever reach the point that uh, reliability is in danger or that performance is significantly impacted. So a bunch of things are coming into uh, play. The strategy is more complicated, but the fact is that companies are paying attention to it, and the result is a more complex but much higher performance environment for a lot of enterprises. Well, folks, I'm afraid that you have used up another hour listening to the best dang enterprise podcast in the universe. That's according to nine out of ten parasitic SSDs. I want to thank our panel for being here, starting with, of course, Mr. Steve Gibson, GRC.com, home of SpinRight Shields Up, and very soon the authentication system that will save the planet. Steve, it's, it's always a pleasure. I, I, I enjoy speaking with you. I've had you on on Twiat. I've had you on uh, on Coding 101. I've even had you on Know How. So uh, could you tell well, the folks where else they can find you? I'm going to have you on Security Now for the next three weeks. And so, I am so excited. <laughs> so right back at you. <laughs> well, of course, they're going to find you at grc.com. Where, yep. where else do you want them to go? 
Uh, that's really my home. GRC.com is where I hail from. You can find Spin right there. And now we have learned that it is successfully recovering SSDs for people uh, just as it does for hard drives. Uh, so, in fact, it, it's really it was that realization that that Spinrite was not going to end up, you know, going the way of the dodo bird as as hard drives did that it's that uh, it caused me to say, hey, this thing has another decade of life in it, probably. So uh, beyond Spinrite six, which I will be getting back to as soon as I get Squirrel launched, you know, the six one six two six three, in order to sort of catch Spinrite up with today's technology and in fact i'm de I'll, i'm developing that new technology specifically because that will sort of the 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 end of the 6 line will be setting the the will be allowing me to develop the, the technology foundations for a complete rewrite which will be spinrite 7 and that'll do all kinds of other things that that uh, that you know the world really needs now, like running on multiple drives at once, and and all kinds of things that, that people want. The the, the the existing architecture for Spinrite uh, can't handle. But yeah, everything I do is at grc.com. There's a main menu though uh, there, so you can just sort of uh, poke around. And as you said, um, the last year and a half, I've been working on this new approach for authentication to replace usernames and passwords, and um, we're getting very close. There you have it, folks. If you have an IT toolbox and you don't have a copy of Spinrite in it, you don't have an IT toolbox. Steve Gibson, again, we'll see. Actually, I'll see you tomorrow on your tomorrow show. Tomorrow at 1.30. So yep. I'll, I'll reciprocate. Thank you very much. I, of course, thanks to my good friends and my co-host, starting with Mr. Brian Chi Chibert. Thank you for being on. Thank you for, for braving a really hot lab at the moment. Could you please tell the folks what you're involved with in over the next week or so and where they can find you? Actually, I am working with the Hawaii Space Flight Lab and a bunch of high school kids that are building drones that are able to run their software called Cosmos. Now, the interesting thing is that Cosmos is designed to run a constellation of satellites. And what the kids are doing is they're applying Cosmos onto drones and they're going to be flying a constellation of drones. So I have definitely pointed them to your know-how episodes so they can get some tips and tricks. And we're working on 3D printing their drones at the moment. Oh, we can do better than that. I'll just have to come over and, and teach a few seminars. You bet. <laughs> okay. Uh, and thank you also to Curtis Franklin from Information Week Radio. Uh, Curtis, always a pleasure. Uh, we'll get your technical difficulties fixed, but could you please tell the folks what you're going to be doing on Information Week Radio over the next week? Actually, we're taking a break for the holiday on uh, Information Week Radio, but we'll be back in July with a lot of new shows, a bunch of great stuff going on. Please check back at informationweek.com. And this week, I am doing an article on Fortran uh, and the Fortran. exciting future of Fortran in the enterprise and the Internet of Things. So uh, be looking for that. I would love to have lots of great comments on just how much fun can be had with a lovely Fortran compiler. You just made geeks around the world smile, a knowing smile. I, that's, that's, that's a gift. Thank you. Thank you so very much, Curtis. And folks, of course, thank you. Thank you to the people who make Twite possible. If it wasn't for our incredibly loyal audience, we wouldn't have a show. And so we want to do something for you. We want to make it easy for you to get all of our episodes into your device of choice. Just go to our show page at twit.tv slash twiet. There you'll find all of our back episodes in case you want to find out a top, uh, read about a topic or listen to a topic that we've covered in the past. You'll also find these little menus on our redesigned site. It's a beautiful site now where you can get a feed for the audio version, for the low def video version, for the standard def video version, for the high def video version. Do you want it on your iPad, your Android tablet? Do you want it on your, your notebook, your PC, your, your Mac, your Windows box, whatever it's gonna be, we've got a format for you. Just go to twit.tv slash twiet. Also, you can find me on my Twitter page. Please, please follow me at twitter.com slash Padre SJ. That's P-A-D-R-E-S-J. If you follow me, you're going to find out what we're going to be doing for every episode of every show that I do here on the Twit TV network. And you also get to see what I do in between shows, which includes things like sitting on a beach, watching the sun, or 
playing with puppies, or watching Cranky Hippo crash on his bike. It's, it's one of the things that I do because, well, I just love engaging with the Twit TV audience. Don't forget that we do this show live most of the time, not today, but most of the time, Fridays at 1 o'clock p.m. Pacific time. You can find us at live.twit.tv. If you join us live, you'll get to see the pre-show, the post-show, and everything in between, including the parts that we cut out. And finally, as long as you're going to be watching live, go ahead and jump into our chat room at irc.twit.tv so that you can give me feedback. I actually look at the, 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 the comments that you make. You get to be part of the show. Again, that's irc.twit.tv. One last thing, thanks to everyone here who makes this show possible, to Lisa, to Leo, of course, to viewers like you, of course, to the engineers, Jammer B and Burke, and to my fantastic TD, Zach, Eskimo Zach, could you please tell the folks where they can find you on the TwitTV network? Yeah, you guys can find me on Twitter where occasionally Padre shows up to <laughs> fly his drone around. Ah, you have way too much time back there. Just, I don't know how that happens. In any case, folks, I'm Father Robert Ballas there. Just reminding you that if you want to know what's going on in the Enterprise, just keep quiet. Yeah.